Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about why p-values don't mean what you think they mean. If you're not sure what a p-value is, you might want to go and check out a video all about p-values. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to assume that you do know. As usual, down below, there is a link to a PDF version of these slides. All right, so I want to first just remind everybody what a p-value is, at least informally. The uh, American Statistical Association came out a couple of years ago with this statement that a p-value is the probability under a specified statistical model that a statistical summary of the data would be equal or more extreme than its observed value. All right, so the definition I typically give uh, is pretty much the same thing, but worded slightly differently. Again, if you don't know what p-value is, you might want to go check that out first. All right, so the first reason that it doesn't mean what you think it means is that usually we're trying to make statements about a population parameter, and usually we do not have a random sample from that population. So if you don't have a random sample, and maybe I should be clear here, by random sample, I don't mean like haphazardly picking individuals. I mean like pulling out a random number generator, assigning numbers to each of the units in the population, and drawing them at random via some random number generator mechanism. Okay, and if you don't have this kind of random sample from the population, then you cannot make statistically valid statements about that population. All right, so that's point number one. Uh, point number two is going to actually throw out the rest of, I think, what we're talking about today. We're going to be using the idea of a t-test, uh, at least a normal model. Okay, so uh, reminder, we have a normal model. We have independent observations from that normal model. We have some mean that's unknown, some variance that is unknown, and we're going to make a uh, do a hypothesis test about that mean. The null here is going to be that the mean is equal to some particular value, call it mu naught. And the alternative is that it's just not equal to that value. All right, uh, we're going to calculate what's called the t statistic, that is the sample average minus the hypothesized value in the null hypothesis, divided by the sample standard deviation over the square root of n. And under the null hypothesis, that happens to have a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. All right, we're going to take that t statistic and we're going to calculate a p value. Here's the formula to calculate the p value for this particular test. Um, and if we get a p-value that's small enough, then we will reject the null hypothesis, right? That is, if it's below our predetermined significance level, call it A. All right, so that's the standard t-test using a p-value to determine whether to reject the null or not. All right, so what does that mean? That's really the question now. And the American Statistical Association came out with some suggestions here. One, it said a p-value can tell you how incompatible the data are with a specified statistical model. In our case, that specified statistical model is the model associated with the null hypothesis. If we decide to reject the null, I guess what we're saying is that we're okay with saying that the data are incompatible with the model associated with that null hypothesis. Okay, great, but what was our null model? Our null model was this model right here where all I've done is changed the model for the data, but now I've plugged in the value for the mean that we have from that null hypothesis. But this compact notation here actually means quite a bit, right? So what does it mean? It means that the data are independent, normally distributed, common mean, mu naught, common variance, sigma squared. So when we say that the data are incompatible with this model, we're really saying one of a few things could be at play here. Number one, the data could not be independent. Number two, the data could not be normal. Number three, the data could not have a constant variance. Number four, maybe the mean is in fact not mu naught. That was the thing that you thought you were testing in the first place. And finally, it could be that you just got unlucky, right? It could be that all these are true, right? But you set your significance level in such a way that you know you're going to make mistakes sometimes. And in this case, right, maybe you just got unlucky. Right, so my point here is that there's many other things that could be going wrong that aren't just that the mean is not the value that you thought than it was in that null hypothesis. Now, if you're a statistician or a knowledgeable scientist about statistics, you might be complaining a little bit at this point. You might say, but the t-test is robust. It's robust for testing a population mean. And what they mean by that is that it doesn't have to be normally distributed. Maybe some lack of independence uh, is okay, right? Uh, the variance being not constant, but not crazy, that's okay. And so I totally agree, right? So it is robust. Uh, but we still need some mechanism by which to uh, evaluate whether it's robust in our circumstance. 
And one of my uh, suggestions in this video is that I think as statistical educators, we tend to do a poor job of providing individuals the tools to make those judgments early on in their statistical education. So I think we need to be talking much earlier about independence, about uh, distributional assumptions on the models that are involved in the hypothesis tests that we're doing. All right, so this is my attempt to uh, present it early on, right? If you're doing a hypothesis test of this nature, you should definitely check model assumptions. Some small deviations from those model assumptions will be okay because t-tests are robust, but other ones won't be. And uh, in the end, it's going to end up being a bit of a judgment call on your part. Okay, so there's a bunch of modeling concern. There's other concerns though. In particular, the American Statistical Association came out and said in that same statement, oh, by the way, I'm gonna put a link down below uh, about the particular statement that they made. Uh, and in that statement, it said that scientific inclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold, which kind of goes against exactly what I said a couple slides ago when I said if the p-value is less than a significance level, you reject the null hypothesis. So why did the American Statistical Association say this? Um, to think about it, let's think about situations where we perhaps, in these different situations, we're going to think about a scenario where we got a p-value that's 0.05. Or if you prefer, it's just slightly below 0.05, such that we could reject the null given a standard 0.05 threshold. Okay, so the scenario, the first one is, suppose that you got that p-value out of a small-scale agricultural field trial. I'm actually involved in one of these right now. It's a paired design experiment. We have seven pairs, so not a very big experiment. Um, and so suppose that something we're looking at out of that experiment got a p-value of 0.05. Now contrast that with a different experiment. Here's an experiment where maybe you uh, have a set of cards and you pull out a card and you, the experimenter, are looking at the card and the individual on the other side is supposed to tell you whether it is red or black. Okay, So this might be called an ESP or extrasensory perception experiment. And suppose you did that for a small number of times and you got a p-value of 0.05. Right? Contrast those two scenarios with this scenario. Right now we're in the midst of COVID-19. There's a lot of vaccine trials for COVID-19 that are ongoing right now. Some of those will end up being quite large. And suppose that out of that uh, clinical trial, we get a p-value that is talking about perhaps the effectiveness of that vaccine, and that p-value is 0.05, okay? Large scale here, I mean with say thousands of participants, you know, something like that. So what does that p-value mean, mean in that context? Here's a fourth and final example. Um, right now, I'm sure scientists are trying to study for COVID-19, uh, what possible genetic factors relate to the progression of the disease. Are there certain genes that are protective? You might have heard uh, reports of O-type blood being protective against COVID-19 disease progression, that kind of thing. So imagine that what they're doing is they're taking a whole set of genes, or probably SNPs, they're taking 30,000 of them, and they're saying which of these seem related to disease progression. And perhaps they have a relatively small number of individuals in their trial. Okay, so they have uh, 30,000, uh, genes, but a small number of individuals. So there's a different scenario, and imagine that in that scenario, one of those genes, I'm not saying anything about the rest of them, but just one of them, happens to have a p-value that's about 0 0.05. All right, so hopefully you can imagine that the interpretation of the p-value depends on what other factors are involved, right? What is the context of the overall experiment? That is, it's not sufficient to just simply say if the p-value is less than 0.05, we reject the null, right? That is, the context here matters. I have heard that in physics, the threshold is 0 0.001. So I'd be really curious in the comments down below if anybody's in physics, if uh, that's sort of a standard in the field of physics. Now, there's probably individuals watching this video, uh, scientists who are now complaining again, right? And they're complaining because uh, they know that we have solved, as statisticians, some of these problems. And it's true, right? Uh, there are things like multiple comparison adjustments for that last example that should be done, right? And there are other things that we can do, right? Bayesian approaches for that extrasensory perception experiment and so forth, right? So statisticians have definitely solved these problems. Uh, and my only point here is that 
uh, a sort of standard approach to hypothesis testing where p-value is less than 0.05 means reject uh, is not sufficient. You, as the data analyst, need to know the context of the problem in order to properly interpret what that p-value means. Okay, so now uh, let's forget that. So let's say context doesn't matter because we know exactly the contents. We have one of the simplest models we could possibly think of. We have a single observation from a normal model with a variance of 1 and an unknown mean. And all we're interested in is testing whether that mean is 0 or not. Okay, so we know the context. That's the context. I'm not worried about model assumptions. All the model assumptions are true. Okay. All I'm wondering about now is, okay, so suppose you've collected data and you get a p-value and it's 0.05. Or if you prefer, just below 0.05 so that you could reject that null hypothesis. Okay, the question now is, what does that really mean? Right? Does it really mean that the alternative is true? Okay, we're going to see in a second what, whether that means it or not. So one way to think about what it means is to say, let's calculate the probability that the null is true given that p-value that we've seen. Now, if you're a Bayesian or heard of Bayesian ideas, you might be thinking we're going a Bayesian approach here, and we're not. I'm interpreting this probability uh, as a relative frequency probability. So one way you might think about this is that as a scientist, you might go out uh, and over the course say, of your lifetime, conduct a whole bunch of experiments, calculate a whole bunch of p-values, and some set of those p-values are going to be, say, very close to 0.05. And so the question is, in those experiments where you got a p-value that was 0.05, how often was the null hypothesis actually true? Or if you want to extend this and say, look, there are a lot of scientists all around the world that are calculating p-values all the time. A number of them are calculating p-values that are close to 0.05. And the question then becomes, in that subset of scientists and tests where they happen to get a p-value of 0.05 and they're testing a particular null hypothesis, how often is that null hypothesis actually true? All right, so we as statisticians, we uh, know how to solve this problem. We just use Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule allows us to flip the conditioning. So now on the numerator, we have the probability of observing a p-value that's 0.05 if the null is true times the probability that null is true, divided by that same term and a similar term, but now that replaces the alternative uh, for that null hypothesis. All right, so this is fine. Uh, that's just what Bayes' rule tells us we can do. Unfortunately, we can't actually do the calculation, right? So first off, this pH naught, this is how often the null hypothesis is true. Reminder that it's a relative frequency. So how often that null hypothesis is true Right across all the people who are doing this test. Okay, so think about all those scientists doing all the different tests in the world. Uh, right, how often is that null true? And unfortunately, we don't know. Right, the whole reason that the scientists are doing the experiments is because they don't know if the null is true, and so we can't say how often that null is true. Okay, so we don't know what this is. Secondly, we need to know how often you observe a p-value that's 0.05 if the alternative is true. Maybe it's not clear, but mathematically I can determine exactly how often it's going to occur if the null is true, right? This is just a normal model. It's got a known mean at zero under the null hypothesis, a known variance, and I can do the calculation. That's no problem. Uh, by the way, I'm not thinking about p being exactly 0.05, but let's say within some kind of uh, error. Okay, so now we need it for the alternative, though. And the difficulty here is that we need to have some information about the alternative. And so the way that we're going to proceed is to have a distribution for the mean parameter when that alternative is true. So we know it's not zero, but what is it? It's going to have a distribution, and we'll sample from that distribution for any particular experiment. OK, so that's the setup. Now, here we're going to be using a Shiny app that I developed. If you use R, I would really appreciate it if you would run it yourself. Uh, the code is here. I'll also put the code down below in the description so you can run it quickly. Um, if you don't know how to use R, you can click on this link, which will also be down below, or you can type it in. Um, this link, uh, there's a limited number of people you can use it, uh, or total amount of time on a monthly basis. So if you're trying to use the link and you're running into issues, please leave a comment down below, and then I'll try to up the amount of time that I uh, have allocated. Uh, finally, uh, if you run either of those two, what you should be seeing is a screen that looks something like this. All right, now let's go check out the app. All right, so let's check out this app. Uh, 
Before I go too far, I want to just point out that this app was not originally my idea, but this is uh, stolen, if you will, from Jim Berger and Herman Molina, uh, who created a similar app in Java. So this is just my implementation of their idea in Shiny. All right, so uh, as a reminder, we are sticking with our p-value of 0.05, so we're not going to change the first bar yet, but you can feel free to change it on your own. Uh, we're going to have to determine the relative proportion of nulls that are true. Typically, when I run this for the first time with students in class, they just like to leave it at 0.5, so we'll leave it there. The next, we have to determine the distribution for that mean mu uh, when the alternative hypothesis is true. Uh, here, there's a bunch of distributions you can choose from. I'm just going to stick with normal. Sometimes, when you do this with uh, students and they get to choose, they'll pick big signals. So they might make this mean 10. And what I mean by a big signal there is that when the null is not true, what you see are means that are very far away from that null hypothesized value relative to the data variance, which in this case was 1. So here, if we have a normal with a mean of 10 and a variance of 1 for that alternative distribution for mu, uh, that's going to give you values that are typically close to 10 and therefore relatively big compared to our data variance of 1. The next thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to determine the number of simulations. For this demonstration, I'm going to stick with 100. Now, when you run it, sometimes you're going to see an uh, error. Oh, this time it didn't error out at all. Um, so maybe we'll see that error in the future. But if you do get an error, you might want to increase the maximum number of attempts per simulation to, say, 10,000, uh, and that will help uh, alleviate that issue. All right, so uh, in this demonstration, what's being shown here is that when you have this setup, so when you get a p-value that's 0.05, when you have half null and half alternatives true, when you have an alternative distribution that's a normal with a mean of 10 and a variance of 1, then 100% of the time, the null hypothesis is actually true. Right? Remember, you are trying to get a small p-value. In this case, you got 0.05, or if you prefer, just below the threshold, you would reject the null. But in this case, you would be wrong 100% of the time because the null is always true. All right, so now this is caused in this example by the fact that the alternative is so extreme. That is, that you're expecting really big signals. And so if you go back to that Bayes rule, what's happening here is that if the signal is that big, then you would never expect to see a p-value that's only 0.05 when, that null when the alternative hypothesis is true. So that never occurs. The only time you see p-values that are that small is when, in fact, the uh, null hypothesis is true. So big signals are interesting, but uh, they're also the kind of thing that, uh, in this day and age, most of the big signals in science have already been found, right? We are ever increasingly looking for smaller and smaller signals, okay? So let's go back to something that's maybe more reasonable. So we're going to put a mean of zero in for the same normal. All right, so now we have signals that are typically close to our null hypothesized value, but sometimes they can range, right? Uh, what about 5% of them are outside minus 2 and 2 in terms of those means? So if you are under this scenario and you get a p-value that's 0.05, it turns out that the null is true about 35% of the time. What? I thought we specified the significant null to be 0.05 so that when we reject that null, right, we are only making a mistake 5% of the time. And in fact, that that's not true. You're making a 5% mistake when all the null hypotheses are true. Okay, but when you throw the alternative in there, the calculation becomes more complicated. And in this scenario, 35% of the nulls are true. So even though you got a p-value that's 0.05, 35% of those null hypotheses are still true. All right, so let's play around some of the other pieces. All right, so that's fine, but let's say we're better about picking experiments to do. Let's suppose that in the experiments that we do, but before we collect the data, it turns out that only 10% of the null hypotheses are true. So we can move this proportion down to 0.1. And now we find this is great. This says now only 6% of the null hypotheses were actually true. That seems pretty close to our significance level of 0.05 and the p-value that we observed of 0.05. But that's actually just coincidence that those two match up. And in fact, this is really not as promising as you might think. You were very good about picking out experiments. Only 10% of those were true. Now you got p-value of 0.05. And of those experiments where you got a p-value of 0.05, 6% of them are true. 
So that p-value really only brought you from 10% down to 6%, right? So maybe not as impressive as you would hope. If we go the other direction, and we uh, are in the scenario of, say, uh, genetic screening, where we're doing a lot of genes, we typically think that very few of those genes are relevant to whatever phenomenon that we're looking at, and uh, we therefore have a set of null hypotheses, or the probability, the relative frequency of the null is not very high. Say that again. The relative frequency of the null is very high because most of those genes have no impact on the phenomenon that we're studying. So the proportion here, we're going to bring up to say 0.9 and then see what happens. So here, if the uh, proportion of nulls that are true before the experiment is 0.9 and you get a p-value of 0.05, it turns out that it's still 82% probability, approximately, that the null is true. So nowhere close to the error rate that you thought it was. All right, so this is just another sort of illustration that context very much matters, right? And so you need to be careful about how to interpret those p-values, and it might be helpful to think about the underlying experiment and whether the null is likely to be true or not, and if it's not true, what are we likely to see from in our alternative distribution? All right, I uh, recommend that you go and uh, try this uh, app out. If you're interested in understanding how the app works and want me to do a video about how the app works, please leave a comment down below and I'll think about doing that. Alright, now that we're back from using the app, I just want to summarize quickly. So the first thing is that you need a random sample in order to make a statement about the population. You need to evaluate your model assumptions before you uh, take too much stock of a particular p-value. Context always matters. Right? So just because you got a particular p-value doesn't mean much outside of the context in which that p-value arose. And finally, hopefully you saw in that app that the error rate is probably much larger than the significance level which you were expecting to be your error rate. Okay. So I hope you keep watching these videos. Uh, I'll catch you there.